Cuba, one of the largest and most intriguing islands in the world. And around every turn are amazing stories, shocking legends, and secrets waiting to be revealed. A perilous plot against the greatest enemy of the United States. This is not the first attempt that the CIA has taken to assassinate Fidel Castro. A hero's desperate flight to freedom. He's got to hope that he's going to live and survive and that somehow he's going to make it to the United States. And a sacred miracle at the cemetery. It was a secret code. Amelia, wake up. Amelia, I'm here. These are the mysteries of Cuba. Ninety miles off the coast of Florida, this Caribbean island is home to enchanting beaches, fertile valleys, and some of the most beautiful architecture on the planet. More than five decades of communist rule have preserved Cuba in a bygone era. Today, it remains an enigma trapped in time. Nowhere is that more evident than in its capital city, Havana. The antique autos, the colonial architecture, the romantic streets. It's so easy to get lost in the allure of this city. But towering above the streets and alleyways is a far more modern structure. This is the Havana Libre Hotel. When Fidel Castro swept to power in 1959, he made this hotel the temporary seat of the new Cuban government. But not everyone supported Castro and his revolutionaries. And it was here that a sinister mission to eliminate the Cuban leader played out. What daring plot to kill off the most powerful man in Cuba unfolded within these very walls? Nineteen fifty-nine, Havana. Revolutionary leader Fidel Castro has led a successful military campaign to take control of Cuba. Fidel Castro is this larger than life figure. He's the leader of the revolution. He's moved an entire country. But Castro's communist ideas and links to Soviet Russia strike fear into the heart of Cuba's biggest neighbor, the United States. And as the socialist leanings sped up, the US saw a greater sense of urgency in not only discrediting him, but assassinating him. They had already tried to give him an exploding cigar that could potentially kill him. There was a plot to put thallium salt in his shoes, which would effectively make his beard fall out. But none of these schemes have worked. So they come up with a new plan to take down the communist leader. The CIA focuses on the one person who can penetrate his inner circle. Castro's jilted ex-lover, German-American Marita Lorenz, who has returned to the U.S. She's scorned, she's hurt. The CIA realizes that she's vulnerable. They knew she was in love with him, and they talked to her about how he was not only a dangerous person, but he was also going to endanger the security of the United States of America. And they talked to her about how they needed her because of her intimate relationship with Fidel Castro to be part of their plot to assassinate him. Convinced that Castro presents a threat to the U.S., Marita accepts the deadly mission. The CIA knew that Fidel Castro was still held up in the penthouse of the Havana Libre Hotel. She's one of the few people on the planet that has access to Fidel that can go to his penthouse room. And they concoct this plan to give Marita these poison pills that she's going to take to Havana, bring up to his penthouse apartment, dissolve in water, and kill him. She hides the pills in a vat of cold cream so she could get them through Cuban customs. In January 1960, Marita arrives at the Havana Libre Hotel and charms her way past the guards to Fidel's penthouse. 
but the CIA has misjudged the would-be assassin. Face to face with him, she begins to have second thoughts. But of course, she's in the place where they shared so many intimate moments together. Marita's emotions get the better of her, and her plan starts to unravel. Marita's, her heart is racing. She's trying to pull the cold cream off the pills, and it's not working. Then Fidel walks in. Seeing the pills, he realizes that Marita has been sent to kill him. Fidel understands his power over people. He sees her, she's trembling. Castro reaches for his gun. Then he does something totally unexpected. He gives Marita his revolver. He says, go ahead, kill me. Take my life. This is Marita's chance. She drops the gun and falls into Fidel's arms. As Fidel suspected, she can't go through with it. Fidel forgives his former lover and allows her to flee back to the United States. Despite her failure to carry out the assassination, Marita remains involved with covert government organizations for nearly two decades. But this is not the last assassination attempt that the CIA plots against the Cuban leader. In fact, Castro eludes over 600 attempts on his life, including one in which a wetsuit is lined with a deadly bacteria. These efforts only work to embolden the dictator. He rules Cuba for nearly half a century before stepping down and handing the reins to his brother Raul in 2008. And today, the Havana Libre Hotel still stands as a monument to a time when a poisonous love affair almost changed history. Just 10 miles east of Havana is the beautiful village of San Francisco de Paula. Nestled among the quiet coves and rocky bays that line the coast is an idyllic 15-acre property, Finca La Vigia. Built in 1886, this striking property was the home and inspiration to one of the most enigmatic authors of the 20th century, Ernest Hemingway. For nearly two decades, the writer lived and worked here. Today, his beloved boat, his tower office, and even his original typewriter are preserved just as the famed author left them. But behind this writer's paradise is a darker tale of espionage, treachery, and paranoia. 1961, Ketchum, Idaho. Just a year after leaving Cuba, the iconic American author, Ernest Hemingway, is found dead in his home. The cause of his demise? A shotgun wound to his head. The tragic event leaves the American public reeling. Once the news breaks about Hemingway's death, people are devastated. They can't believe that this man, larger than life itself, has now died. It appears that Hemingway took his own life. But one question remains, why? In search of answers, Hemingway's friends and family look to a series of bizarre events that took place in Ketchum in the months leading up to the writer's death. Before he died, Hemingway had told them he believed that in the previous year, he was being followed. He looks at his mail, he believes it's been tampered with. He picks up his phone, he believes that there are people listening to his conversations. He becomes somewhat paranoid. According to his friends and family, Hemingway's behavior had also become increasingly strange. He starts driving at night with his lights turned off. He has to use other people's phones as not to have his phone conversations taped. His relatives had taken the desperate step of sending Hemingway to a mental institution for treatment. But to no avail. 
His paranoia continues, his delusions continue. He's starting to spiral down in depression. It seems as if Hemingway's suicide was simply the result of the author slowly losing his mind. But not everyone buys this theory. In 1983, Jeffrey Myers, a literary scholar using the Freedom of Information Act, obtains an FBI report that reveals shocking new clues about the author's life and death. Clues that lead back to the mysterious land of Cuba. Investigating the life and mysterious death of Ernest Hemingway, a scholar named Jeffrey Myers uncovers a clue that could change everything we know about the iconic author. And it leads back to Hemingway's time on the island of Cuba. So what Myers discovers in this FBI report is really quite amazing. As it turns out, J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, had ordered that Hemingway be tracked. He was really concerned about his subversive politics, about his points of view, about his time in Cuba. In 1939, Hemingway had moved from the US to Cuba and taken up residence in this stunning home really feels at home in Cuba. He found that his political views were welcomed in Cuba and really accepted there. It's here that Hemingway pens some of his best works, such as The Old Man and the Sea and For Whom the Bell Tolls. But his time in Cuba also saw the famed writer embark on a very different career as a Russian spy. Hemingway's subversive politics were known to the Russians, and so he was shortly approached by the KGB. Hemingway was asked to collect valuable information on the US government for the Russian Secret Service. They even give him a code name, Agent Argo. But when the FBI finds out about Hemingway's communist connections, they begin a surveillance operation, following him around, reading his mail, and even tapping his phone. As Hemingway's career flourished, so too did his file at the FBI. During this time, J. Edgar Hoover put together page after page of detail on Ernst Hemingway's every move. But according to the FBI reports, Hemingway ended up being a poor resource for the KGB. As it turns out, Hemingway was a very failed spy. And in 1960, when Hemingway fled Cuba to return to the United States, the FBI continued to monitor him, right up to the author's final days. With this piece of information in hand, the mystery of Hemingway's death is solved. It seems that far from being paranoid, Hemingway was right. He was being watched by the FBI, and that is likely what contributed to his suicide. That ultimately pushes him over the edge. And today, visitors to Hemingway's house, Finca La Vigia, are reminded of a renowned American who also served as a KGB spy. For nearly five centuries, the Plaza de Armas has been one of the main social hubs of Havana. The oldest public square in the city, this was once the site for military parades when Spain controlled this Caribbean island. But the Spanish might faltered when it faced the bold scheme of one American newspaper man hell-bent on making a name for himself. So what was his audacious plan? And how would it build an American publishing empire? 1896, Havana. The Cubans are in a heated battle for their independence from the rule of Spain. And the prisons are filled with rebels. One unlikely imprisoned Cuban revolutionary is 19-year-old Evangelina Cosio y Cisneros. 
She's a young, petite girl, long hair, charismatic, and she comes from what seems an upper caliber family whose father was a rebel, and she's a political prisoner. But one man thinks he has the power to save her. New York publisher, William Randolph Hearst. Hearst has a plan to use Evangelina's story to get a leg up on his arch rival, Joseph Pulitzer. There's a lot of machismo rivalry between Hearst and Pulitzer. They're trying to outdo each other constantly. Hearst thinks that his readers are really going to identify with her and lap this up and it's going to sell papers. Hearst believes if he can bust her out of jail, he could make her a heroine to his readers. It's this crazy, out of control plan that Hearst's going to break Evangelina out of prison, like a real life prison break. And the plucky publisher has just the man to execute his secret scheme. His best reporter, Carl Decker. So Carl's not your ordinary journalist. He's this swashbuckling guy who lives for adventure and danger and just loves a challenge. And Hearst knows he's the perfect guy for this mission. Under the cover of darkness, Decker will secret her out of prison and straight to a hiding place. Angelina is supposed to stay in the safe house until a passenger ship bound for New York arrives at night so she can secretly get on. He begins by smuggling a box of candies laced with narcotics into Evangelina's cell. And the night of the breakout, Evangelina is going to give them to her cellmates so that they're knocked out. A few nights later, Evangelina feeds the candy to her cellmates, while Decker and his cohorts work at springing her free. So in the middle of the night, Decker and his guys find a building that's nearby the prison. They go up to the roof, they shimmy across to the roof of the prison. They fall. They're gonna die or severely hurt themselves. Evading the guards, Decker makes his way to Evangelina's cell and gets to work using a file. And they first try to saw off the metal bars. And amazingly, despite all of the noise of sawing and pulling, the Spanish don't hear it. Decker bundles Evangelina out of the jail and straight to a safe house, where they wait for the ship to escape the island. But there is a problem. The ship is delayed, and the police are scouring the streets for Evangelina. The plan to leave Cuba under cover of darkness is now out of the question. She is like the most wanted woman in all of Cuba. If they're caught, I mean, she could be killed. Will Decker and Evangelina make it out of Cuba alive? It's 1896. Intrepid reporter Carl Decker has just broken Evangelina out of prison, ensuring a heroic headline for William Randolph Hearst. But with police casing the city, he has to find a clandestine way for Evangelina to board a New York-bound vessel in broad daylight. So how will he do it? Things are clearly not going as they were planned. If they're caught, I mean, she could be killed. So they decide that they're going to disguise Evangelina as a boy because she's so small. With a fake ID in hand and a cigarette dangling from her mouth, they leave the safe house. People are looking for her, and she's still not safe. She's timid, she's scared. She doesn't know what her future holds. Decker leads the disguised Evangelina towards the docks, evading the authorities. And then walking in plain sight, she gets onto the passenger ship. Finally free, Evangelina heads for New York. Hearst wastes no time. He 
he splashes across the headlines that Evangelina is safe and that his journalist had a hand in doing it. It's called jailbreak journalism. Two days later, on October 14th, Evangelina arrives in New York City to great fanfare. Hearst's journalism really pays off. All of his sensational headlines are selling millions and millions of papers. The esteemed newspaper magnate also succeeds in the circulation battle, besting his arch rival. And today, the beautiful Spanish colonial architecture of Plaza de Armas stands as a reminder of a once formidable power and one tenacious tycoon's will to conquer the American publishing world. In the heart of downtown Havana, the necropolis de Cristobal Colon is named for the great explorer. Built in 1876, these 140 acres are known as Ciudad de los Muertos, City of the Dead, with these intricate monuments, elaborate entrance gate, and over one million grave sites. But one particular grave stands out from the rest. This tomb is the site of a century-old miracle that changed Cuba forever. What mystical event happened here, creating an everlasting legend? 1900, Havana, Cuba. An attractive girl named Amelia Gori falls deeply in love with a young man below her social class. So this is the story of two star-crossed lovers, Jose Vicente Adat, a man born on the wrong side of the tracks, and Amelia Gori, a beautiful young woman from high society. Amelia's family does not approve of the relationship. The poor and the rich are not supposed to mix, and Amelia's father has really strong feelings against Jose. So to impress Amelia's parents, Jose goes off to fight in the Cuban War of Independence. When Jose comes back, he is a decorated war hero, and Amelia's family agrees to let the pair wed. They're finally living happily ever after, but unforeseen events will happen that'll change not only their lives, but the fabric of Cuba itself. After the two lovers marry, Amelia announces she's pregnant. But in her eighth month, things take a turn for the worse. She develops hypertension. And Jose can't believe it, but within a few weeks, Amelia and the baby are gone. Jose has suddenly lost all that is precious to him. As tradition dictates, he buries his wife, carefully laying the child at her feet. Jose wants to commemorate her in some way, so he hires a sculptor to create a larger-than-life statue of her that sits right next to the grave. The statue depicts Amelia cradling her baby in her arm, as Jose had always imagined she would in life. In his despair, Jose visits the tomb every day. There, he performs his own special ritual at the gravesite. He visits three times a day, each time talking softly to her. And he begins knocking with this brass ring close to her heart. It was a secret code. Amelia, wake up. Amelia, I'm here. It was a reminder to her spirit that he was still watching over her. And he leaves each time walking backwards, placing his hat over his heart, never taking his eyes off his beloved's grave. So this ritual goes on for almost 15 years, with Jose repeatedly coming to the gravesite. He never misses a day. Jose's heart literally is about to give out, and so he becomes gravely ill. Knowing his time is short, Jose has one last request. He asks that the tomb be opened. He wants to be able to look upon the face of his beloved. One more time. 
But when the tomb is open, what Jose discovers is so shocking, it will forever change his country. It's 1914. The broken-hearted widower, Jose Adot, has spent years mourning the passing of his wife and child. Now, as he himself approaches death, he makes one final request, that the vault be opened to see his beloved one last time. But what Jose finds is something truly incredible. The baby that he had laid at the feet of his wife is somehow moved and is cradled now in Amelia's arms. It is a mirror image of the statue he had built for Amelia. When news of the bizarre discovery gets out, Amelia becomes known throughout Cuba as La Milagrosa, the miracle woman. And as the years go by, theories spring up to explain the strange occurrence. People believe that Amelia had this rare disease called encephalitis lethargica, which is this sleeping sickness where people go into death-like comas, but they're still very, very much alive. If she did have this illness, some wonder if she could have woken up and moved the baby herself. But other historians hypothesize that this mystical event was simply a hoax. People believe that someone had actually tampered with the grave. But perhaps the most appealing explanation is the one that Jose himself believed in. Jose dies believing that he's been given a sign that life exists beyond the grave, that love can really transcend tragedy. And this mystical story draws devotees near and far. People from all over begin visiting the grave and bringing with it their own petitions, their own seeking for miracles. And today, the pilgrimage to the tomb of La Milagrosa is a common thread for Cuban citizens of many backgrounds. The site stands as a symbol, reminding us that true love and devotion can transcend death itself. Havana is known for its epic Caribbean sunsets, classic 1950s cars, and one sport above all others, baseball. The most hallowed grounds for the Cuban national pastime can be found here at Estadio Latino Americano. This stadium is home to the Industriales, Havana's baseball dynasty, producing some of the most talented players in the world. These outfields are adorned with messages that invoke worker unity. But this socialist system turned on one of its own, a star pitcher who had made this stadium his home. Who was this baseball player? And what epic break for freedom did he make? 1995, Havana. Cuba is in the midst of a severe economic crisis, and people are looking to escape the country any way they can. It was just a terrible and a dark time in Cuba. But if there is one thing Cuba still has national pride in, it's baseball. Baseball to the country of Cuba is akin to breathing. It's a part of the DNA. Two of the country's best players are a pair of brothers, both pitchers, who play in the Cuban National League. Orlando Hernandez is the greatest pitcher in the modern age in Cuba. He stops traffic walking down the streets. His brother, Levon, 10 years his junior, just phenomenal control to be able to put the ball exactly where he wanted. Levon has big dreams of leaving Cuba to make a fortune playing baseball in the US. Levon gets the bug, I gotta leave, I gotta go, and uh, speaks to his older brother to say, would you like to come with me? And Orlando, who was bound by family considerations and is quite happy, declines. Levon decides to take his chances. One day, while in Monterey, Mexico, for an away game, he defects.
Before long, word spreads across Cuba that Levon has made his way to the United States and signed a contract with the Florida Marlins. Cuban officials are convinced Levon could not have escaped without help. And the authorities decide that uh, he was in cahoots with his brother Orlando. Embarrassed by Levon's actions, the Cuban government retaliates against Orlando. Orlando is summoned here to a Estadio Latino Americano. He's accused of being a traitor, never to play baseball again. It's obvious that Orlando Hernandez is being punished for the sins of his brother because Levon Hernandez has jumped the national team. Orlando is treated as an exile in his own country. He loses his baseball career, his home, and nearly everything precious to him. Orlando Hernandez is categorized as public enemy number one. Professionally and emotionally bereft, Orlando lives vicariously, listening to his brother's success in American baseball on the radio. Levon Hernandez is 22 years old at the time in which he becomes the youngest pitcher to ever start a World Series game in 1997. And because of his great performance, the team wins the World Series and he wins the Most Valuable Player Award. Levon's success triggers Orlando to make the hardest decision of his life. He too will defect, leaving his family behind, hoping to reunite with them later. Orlando decides, I've got to go. I have to take a chance and I've got to go. I am basically a political prisoner. What do I have to lose now? At the break of dawn, Orlando and a few others set sail on a dangerous mission, defecting from Cuba to the Bahamas, where they will catch a boat to the US. He's got to hope that he's going to live and survive and that somehow he's going to make it to the United States. They travel over 10 excruciating hours to an abandoned and desolate island near the Bahamas. They are on this island anticipating that another boat is going to pick them up. The other boat doesn't show up. Orlando and the gang wait, but no rescue boat arrives. The stark reality hits him. The boat may never come. Will Orlando and his group ever make it to safety? It's 1997. Cuban ace pitcher Orlando Hernandez and a band of fellow defectors are making a dangerous bid for freedom by sailing away from their homeland and headed for the U.S. So can this baseball legend make it to the land of the free? They are on this island anticipating that another boat is going to pick them up. And one day becomes two and two days become three. Three days become four. Now they're in a situation where they're starting to think, we've come here to die. Then, out of nowhere, a Coast Guard boat appears on the horizon. Miraculously, a US Coast Guard boat appears to pick them up. But the Bahamian government wants to return the group to Cuba, where they will go to jail or be executed. There are very few secrets in baseball, even around the world. When word gets out that one of these defectors is Levon's brother, Orlando, US baseball teams begin to clamor. Soon, the New York Yankees offer him a contract and a chance to enter the US. The New York Yankees at that time were the center of the universe in Major League Baseball. And from the very beginning, he pitches very well 
Looks like he has been in the major leagues for many, many years. In 1998, Orlando helps the Yankees win the World Series. And for his prize, he asks for assistance bringing his family to New York. That October, he is granted his wish. Today, this baseball stadium stands as a reminder of one superstar who risked it all to play the game he loved. The verdant fields of Cuba are planted with three major agricultural crops, coffee, exotic fruits, and tobacco. But back in the early 20th century, Cuba had almost an exclusive reliance on a single sweet product, sugarcane. And one Cuban locale more than any other is linked to the sugar industry. Once a boom town employing hundreds, now old smokestacks, scrap metal, and large blocks of concrete stand as reminders of its former glory. This is Hershey Town. Named for the American chocolatier Milton Hershey, the story behind this abandoned factory town is one of imagination, innovation, and forgotten dreams. How did this place save America's favorite chocolate? 1916, Hershey, Pennsylvania. Milton Hershey has built a chocolate empire from scratch, and in the process, risen to fame and fortune. Hershey's milk chocolate is everywhere. You can find it at newsstands, the grocery stores, in vending machines. Everywhere you look, there are Hershey's milk chocolate bars. But the Great War throws the world into chaos. The fighting destroys agriculture, decimating sugar production across Europe. The world supply decreases by almost 20%. At the very same time, Milton Hershey, his business is growing and his demand and need for sugar is increasing. If Hershey's sugar supplies run out, his precious milk chocolate cannot be produced, which could leave him on the brink of disaster. So he looks to the tropical climate of Cuba, hoping to find abundant sugarcane fields he can claim as his own. Milton Hershey goes up the coast and um, comes up to a plateau. The sugarcane fields are plentiful. There's a great source for water, and he decides that this will make a perfect location to build uh, his new sugar mill. Hershey has found the cane fields that can save his business. But now he faces a new problem. It's in the middle of nowhere. There's no good transportation. He's going to have to figure out a way to get his sugar to the ports to be able to be shipped out. Hershey must devise a way to transport millions of pounds of sugar through the forbidding Cuban wilderness. It's 1916. Milton Hershey is on a determined quest to find a new source of sugar for his chocolate company. And he's found one here in the Cuban countryside. But with no infrastructure, Hershey has to figure out how to get workers to and from his factory and how to transport the sugar to the ports. So can this captain of the chocolate industry find the recipe for sweet success in this foreign land? He's going to have to invest significant resources into the islands to make this whole scheme of his successful. So in April 1916, sparing no expense, Hershey gets to work on a state-of-the-art project, the likes of which Cuba has never seen before. He builds the country's first and only high-speed rail line. This 53-mile technological marvel is even served by its own power plant. In time. 
time, Hershey's sugar refinery is built and, complete with its own railroad, works flawlessly. The railroad enables the country to open up a part of the country that had been inaccessible to future development. And at the head of the line, he founds a unique town that is another first for Cuba. The town that he builds for his sugar mill is a model town. He builds well-built housing for his workers. This town features broad streets that are paved with sidewalks, many recreational amenities, such as ball fields and tennis courts. Within a few years, Central Hershey is an engineering marvel. This major transport center can haul millions of pounds of sugar per year. Eventually, the chocolate town swells to 1,000 inhabitants, and the Cubans are impressed by Hershey's generosity. The town that Milton Hershey creates to support his workers in Central Hershey becomes a, a vibrant community. Stores, a movie theater, uh, free schools for this worker's children, free health care for his workers. But the good times don't last forever. In 1959, the revolution takes over Cuba and the industry is nationalized. When the sugar business fails, the property falls into ruin. And even though the train continues to run, the whole community falls into despair. Today, this shell of a once thriving sugar town is a memorial to a great American's quest for chocolate domination and the bittersweet rewards of ingenuity and benevolence. From a verdant vision to a vindictive vixen, a plagued writer to an impassioned pitcher. These are the mysteries of Cuba.